Hey, how's everyone doing? Robin Kurz here, back again for MotionVFX.com. And with this first part of a whole series of videos, I have the huge pleasure of showing you around the truly amazing new 3D tool, MO2, available as a plugin exclusively for Final Cut Pro 10 and Motion from MotionVFX. Yes, it's finally here, and as I think you'll see as well, MO2 isn't just another plugin, but effectively an app within an app. Because the level of complexity of MO2 and how I think it can expand your creative options as well, and all of that directly within Final Cut Pro and Motion, is for me absolutely mind-blowing. I think adding MO2 to one's arsenal will in fact eliminate the need for most other 3D applications, at least for the vast majority of things I think most will need or want to do. Either way, I dare you not to be impressed. But then talk is cheap, so let's get started and let me give you a quick first look at this amazing tool before we dig in much deeper with the episodes to follow. MO2, as with anything you purchase from the MotionVFX site, is downloaded and installed via the M Installer, MotionVFX's brilliant little helper app that you download for free from the site and find in the menu bar after installing it. After that, all you need to do is open Final Cut Pro 10 and look in the Titles browser where you'll find a new category appropriately named MO2. Here you'll find an awesome selection of pre-made templates divided into various themes made by the amazing designers at MotionVFX that you can of course use and change any way you like. But if you prefer to start entirely from scratch, then you can do that too. In which case you simply look in your generator's browser where you'll find an MO2 category as well with just a single template in it. This is an empty MO2 generator with nothing more than the default background. But we'll stick with the pre-made templates for now so we can get to know the basics of MO2 better and get back to this in a later episode. You can, of course, as with any clip, title, etc., preview any and all of them by simply skimming over them. And hitting the spacebar even gives you a real-time preview of the scene as expected. So this huge selection of templates that MotionVFX have generously provided for absolutely free is divided into seven different themes within the MO2 category, ranging from basic at the top to projects at the bottom. The difference is really only being in which context they are intended to be used. So for example, the basic templates are just that, basic. They're simple scenes with no animation, no transparency, a few lights, and a model in the middle for you to replace with your own to simply give you a basic starting point instead of just emptiness. The general purpose titles will usually be scenes with just one or more text placeholders for you to customize, but are of course not limited to other changes beyond that either. Then we have logos, which will be scenes that have one or more objects as their main focal point in that scene that can be replaced with a logo, graphic, or whatever you have available to you as an SVG file. Then there is, of course, the obligatory collection of great looking lower thirds, ranging from relatively simple to sports style lower thirds and many more. Overlay titles, on the other hand, are, surprise, surprise, made to be overlaid over existing video or any other media you might have in your timeline, meaning they'll have transparency before, during, and or after their animation so that you can superimpose it over anything you like. And last but not least, we have product presentations and projects where in the presentations you see the cute little paper bag again, or maybe some other object as a placeholder being presented in different, sometimes more, sometimes less animated scenes. And finally, projects. If you're already familiar with MotionVFX's templates, as I'm sure many of you are, then you'll know that these will be more elaborate, masterfully designed and animated scenes that will contain any number of drop zones that you can populate with media from anywhere in your library or project. 
Of course, they can contain a replaceable object or text, as well as can be edited in any other way that you like. So you can see that with MO2, you're not only getting amazing functionality, but also a lot of great looking content to spice up your projects. So let's just add one to our project, and adding any given template is of course just as easy as anything else. If you're using a general purpose template, for example, you can simply append it to your project using the E key. Or if it's an overlay title, you can connect it with the Q key. Or of course, simply drag and drop it to its desired spot in the timeline. I'll just append one of these logos with my E key so we can take a look at it. And if I created the project using the automatic settings and the MO2 template is the first thing I'm adding to it, I'm immediately asked which properties the project should have since MO2's templates and generators are of course just as any other title or generator resolution and frame rate agnostic. I'll just go with the standard HD 25 frames per second settings. Once added, I have to wait a few seconds for it to load. The template is added and I can hit Shift Z to fit my timeline to the window. And after loading, as with any other clip or title, I can simply skim the template in the timeline, at which overall speed depends on your machine and the complexity of the scene. If I option click somewhere on the title, I can select it and position my playhead over it at the same time. With that, we can see a few things have happened. The most obvious is that our viewer is now populated with various overlay elements that are of course new and specific to MO2. On the left I have the panel for the so-called camera post effects. With the little button at the bottom I can move it to either side of the viewer and with the button at the top left I can hide or unhide it. I'll leave it hidden for now and we'll get back to it later. Along the top, we have a few additional buttons for switching from the active camera to the perspective camera, a concept that motion users will be very familiar with, along with two view modes and four buttons for navigating the scene, which we'll also get back to in detail later. The two view modes in the middle are a wrench icon for the so-called constructor mode and a diamond icon for the so-called beauty mode. If I switch to the constructor mode, then another two things happen. For one, all of the camera post effects that we saw in the side panel are switched off temporarily, as well as the side panel itself becoming unavailable. So in this mode, various very process intensive effects such as blurs, glows, depth of field, or ambient occlusion are not rendered. That in turn will of course speed up my preview considerably. So if you're on a machine that doesn't have the greatest of specs, and is therefore very slow at previewing, then switching to constructor mode while editing creating your scene can of course be a huge help. And once you're ready for output, you can switch back to beauty mode for the finishing touches. But now to the viewer itself. The Motion VFX team have come up with what I feel is a pretty smart selection concept. If I run my mouse across the scene in the viewer, a highlighted outline around the object that I'm over appears. With that, there is no more guessing what might happen if I click. So if I move my mouse over my scene, whenever I pass over any particular object, its outline is highlighted. That way, if I want to select anything in particular, I don't have to scroll through an endless list of scene elements or click and hope I'm on the object that I want, but rather I just wait until it highlights, for example, my text element, and click. And that object is selected both in the scene as well as in the scene content list and the so-called 3D gizmo for it shows up. This is yet another brilliant idea from the Motion VFX team. Whilst regular motion users will be familiar with something very familiar from Motion's interface, this is the next level. The 3D gizmo consists of various little control elements. Moving your mouse highlights the different elements, once again telling you that if you click at that moment, you're able to manipulate that element. There are of course three red, green, and blue, or X, Y, and Z axes, with which I can move an element on that axis. Then there are the three rotation elements, which are just like in motion, in the form of three little circles around the gizmo. But unlike motion, if I click one of them once, they all become active, and I can simply grab and drag either of them to rotate the selected object on that axis. Clicking on one of the arrows, for example, deactivates them again. But there are also three additional control elements along each axis in the shape of a little box. These are the scale controls for each axis. So if I click and drag any one of these, the object is scaled along that axis. 
Holding the Command key even allows you to select several objects at once, effectively giving them a joint 3D gizmo, which I can use to manipulate all of them at the same time. That's pretty cool. So with this, I can perform all the necessary basic transformations of any given object without having to go into another window or scroll through a long list of parameters. Nice. So where do I find a list of my scene structure and the various other parameters? In the inspector, of course. To be exact, if I have the title selected or the little active clip indicator ball is over in the timeline, then all I have to do is switch to the title inspector tab. Here, in an inset scrollable window, I get a full list of everything I need to manage, edit, and animate my scene divided into various sections. At the top, I always get a section, scene structure, where I can edit the global scene settings, followed by a list of my scene content. Generally starting with a null, or group, for the camera or even cameras in the scene, of which you can in fact use as many as you want to cut to and from followed by any and all models or meshes in the scene, as well as text objects, lights, and so on. All also very easily identified by the icon, if not in fact by their name. If nothing is selected, it ends with four buttons at the bottom for adding objects via a pop-up menu ranging from models to cameras. Then another pop-up for selecting a material for whatever object or even group of objects is selected. I'll of course be getting to both in much greater detail later. The last two buttons are pretty much self-explanatory, one for loading and one for saving my scene data. Again, I'll go into the when, why, and how you would want to use these in a later chapter. This particular template has a couple of unique flare and raise parameters at the bottom, but if I select an object, then I get a long list of additional parameters. For every object, no matter the type, I get a basic section. If I flip this open, I get a bunch of parameters pertaining to its visibility, position, scale, etc. Below the basic settings, you will always find the selection-based parameters. That means, much like you see in Motion in the fourth tab in the Properties Inspector, the parameters that you see here will differ depending on what is selected. So if I select a camera, for example, if I scroll down now, I see camera settings. If I select a text object, then I get a long list of parameters that only text gets, such as the extrusion settings. This particular template, as with many others, has a custom logo slash text group, which, if I look inside, contains any logos or text elements that are meant to be customized. So this is something to look for in any pre-made template for quick and easy editing. For example, by its icon alone, I can already tell that the replace this logo element is an extruded SVG also known as Scalable Vector Graphic, a file format that pretty much every vector-based app, such as Affinity Designer or Adobe Illustrator, can generate. You just need to make sure that the file adheres to the SVG 1.0 specifications, meaning that it needs to have simple path objects, no unconverted text or rasterized elements, etc., to make sure that it comes in looking like it should and can be parsed correctly. On a side note, if you only have a JPEG or PNG of, say, a logo or object you'd like to use, in the next chapter I'll even show you how you can quickly and easily have an SVG generated from it for use in MO2. So stay tuned. At this point, we just want to do a simple replace with an existing SVG from my disk. So if I select the Replace This Logo SVG layer at the top, now all we have to do is scroll down to the selection-based parameters at the bottom. Here, right after the basic parameters, as I already showed you, I now have extrusion settings. And under the first button, Styles, there is a Reload SVG button. Clicking on this opens a dialog window where I can navigate to my SVG, and once I select it and click Choose, I'm presented with a Load SVG window. With this window, Motion VFX has really gone the extra mile to make importing SVGs as intuitive as possible and to avoid leaving more things up to chance than necessary, as well as minimizing surprises in advance, all the while giving me more control over the SVG import process that I've ever seen elsewhere. Here on the left, I get a list of all the qualified layers in the SVG with a Use and Whole checkbox for each layer. Mousing over them gives me a highlighted preview of each individual segment. With this, I can decide on what I want to use and what I want to exclude from the model, as well as which layers are imported as holes, in other words, punch a hole into whatever they're over. 
Once I've made my selection, I simply select Reload. And the scene is populated with the logo from my SVG, with all of the previously applied materials and any animation still intact. Now to check out my title options. Back in our custom logo text group, we see the text objects underneath our SVG. One named Replace This Title Text, which is grayed out, and another named Replace This Subtitle Text. By default, we only see the smaller subtitle text, because if we look at the check mark behind the title text in the list, we can see it has been deactivated. So just in case, for example, I don't want a logo, but rather just two titles. I'll, in fact, take all three. Of course, clicking it activates it, and we now see it in our scene. Being a text object, we also see a text field down below in the selection base section. Here I can simply enter whatever replacement text I like for each text object. I'll just enter MO2 is here for the title, and and it's amazing for the subtitles. Now I can simply move the various elements into the desired positions using the 3D gizmo. And I'm done. I've made my first amazing all 3D title animation in Final Cut Pro 10. Now if I wanted to, I could simply open the camera post effects menu again and tweak the different settings to my liking whereby these changes only always affect the camera that you are currently viewing. If there are multiple cameras in your scene, then these settings need to be adjusted for each camera individually. What each of these are exactly, and how we can customize them in every detail, is something I'll cover much more in depth when I cover the camera settings and export in a later episode. Exporting being something that you can obviously do as with any other title or project. So there you go. That was the first quick introduction to MO2. In the following episodes, we'll look at the real fun. We've only really scratched the surface of this extremely complex and powerful tool. And if you liked what you've seen so far, then give us a like. And if you want to be sure not to miss out on any of the other clips, subscribe and hit that little bell to be notified once they go live. As always, any and all relevant infos and links down below in the description. And in the next episodes, we want to dive much deeper into MO2 and object types, importing your own models, materials, animation, import, and much, much more. So thanks for watching at this point, and I hope to see you in the next videos.